fellow believers in Christ Jesus. Hello and welcome again to Bill King Ministries. Now, this message is the final sermon in my three-part series regarding the end times, the tribulation period, and what Christians throughout the world stand firm on as granting us escape from the tribulation period, the rapture. May God be with us all. Amen. I'm Pastor Bill King, and as always, I thank you for joining me. Now, the title of this message today is The Rapture. Rapture, a verb, carry your way, transport. Now, though the rapture is a critical aspect of Christian piety, we may be surprised to know the term isn't found anywhere in the Holy Bible, rather alluded to in several passages. In the following passages, we find four of the original twelve disciples, Apostles Paul, Matthew, Mark, and John, speaking towards Christians being removed from God's wrath, which shall be poured out upon mankind during the tribulation period. I spoke on the final seven plagues of God's wrath during the tribulation period, and though there may be lingering questions as to what the tribulation period is, and how long it plays out. Now let's see if we can answer those. Tribulation, a noun, distress or suffering resulting from oppression and persecution. Now as used in the Holy Bible, the tribulation is a period of seven years divided by three and a half years each. The first portion referred to as the tribulation and the end portion referred to as the Great Tribulation. Now this shall occur after the signs of the end times have climaxed, the Antichrist has assumed his control over the world, and Christians, that is, the church, raptured away beforehand. Now there's an additional term we must define so as to completely understand the Tribulation. The elect which Jesus refers to in Matthew 24, 22, and Mark 13, 20. The elect are not the Christians, that is, believers, God's church. Many are compel, compl- <laughs> excuse me, compelled to believe. Rather, they are the elect of Israel, the 144,000 sealed ones, that is, the 12 tribes of Israel, referred to in Revelation 7, 1 through 8. Now we won't delve any further into the elect at this time as such is an entire message in itself. Now now that we've clarified and laid the groundwork, let's see what the four apostles have to say, starting with Paul and his epistle to the church in Thessalonica. In quoting, 1 Thessalonians 1 10 and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come Paul unequivocally states deliver us from the wrath to come now Paul was a highly learned man a former Jewish Pharisee, that is, Saul of Taurus, educated under Gamaliel, a Pharisee doctor of Jewish law. He is also regarded as the greatest evangelist who ever preached and author of the majority of the books in the New Testament. Thereby, one would be well advised to trust his logic, as he is logically stating in 1 Thessalonians 1 10, Christians should not anticipate being present during the tribulation period as they will be saved from God's final wrath upon mankind. As Jesus Christ did not suffer and die upon the cross of Calvary in vain, he did so all he did so so that all who shall believe in him are saved, afforded an escape. 
Apostle Paul goes on to explain the order in which those Christians who have previously passed on fallen asleep, and those remaining on earth at the time of Christ's second coming shall be raptured away to meet the descending Christ in the air. And we're quoting 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, according to Apostle Paul, whether Christians are alive at the second coming or deceased, falling asleep, they shall be together with Christ forever, once again clarifying, for God did not appoint us to wrath. Such would not hold true if in fact Christians are present and directly impacted by God's wrath during the seven-year tribulation period. <clears throat> Recall in my previous sermon entitled The Wrath of God Complete, Seven Last Plagues, I pointed out the plagues poured out would be upon those with the mark of the beast and worshiping his image. If Christians were present during this time, such wrath of God would undoubtedly spill over and impact them as well. And Paul goes on in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 through 10. He says it again. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Now in the following passage, Jesus speaks towards the elect, which we've previously established are the 144,000 sealed ones of Israel, that being the 12 tribes of Israel. And we're quoting Matthew 24, 21 through 22. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been seen since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. And in comparison, in just a minute, we're going to uh, quote Mark 13, 19, 19 through 20. But the only difference between Matthew's accounting and Mark's is a few lines, such as the beginning, the beginning of creation versus the beginning of the world, which God created and whom he chose. Otherwise, the passages speak towards the same thing, the days of the seven-year tribulation period being shortened for the elect's sake. Now, quoting Mark 13, 19 through 20. For in those days there will be tribulation, such as has not been seen since the beginning of creation which God created until this time, nor ever shall be. And unless the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he chose, he shortened the days. And next, we turn to the Apostle John. Now, in John's prophetic revelation, Jesus Christ is saying to John, He shall keep those who keep my command to persevere, in other words, Christians, from the hour of trial. The hour of trial is the seven-year tribulation period. 
and we're quoting John's Revelation 3, 10 through 12. Jesus is saying, Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write him, write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. Now the point of the message, this information, along with the information provided in my previous two sermons concerning the signs of the end times and the final seven plagues of God's wrath, it gives us a general insight into the end of civilization, the second coming of Jesus Christ, the tribulation period, and the final climatic battle of Armageddon. Now there's much greater detail we could, we could uh, discuss concerning the dragon, the beast, the signs attributed to the beast, that is to fool and convince those non-believers remaining on earth, the mark of the beast, the elect, that is the 144,000 sealed ones of Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel, the woes and the two witnesses spoken of in Revelation 11, 1 through 14. Yet doing so is a virtual lifetime study. It's not the point of this series to address each aspect in detail, rather to, to provide a definitive overview of what we've discussed. I pray we've been successful. Now in conclusion, I try not to dwell on the end times in the book of Revelation so much as what will be, will be. It's written in the Holy Bible for all to discern for themselves. Rather, I reference such periodically as a means of warning to any and all who have yet to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, or absolutely have doomed their souls to damnation through their refusal to do so. Just as God the Father affords salvation to all those who shall believe through freedom of choice, either they accept and believe, or don't accept and believe, choosing their own inevitable outcome, I follow suit in providing the word of God to any and all who are willing to receive it, not forcing it down anyone's throat. I am not a doomsday prophet, nor a prophet at all, merely a fastidious student of God's word and a minister of such by God's grace and calling. It's up to each individual to make a personal decision based upon the information provided via Holy Scripture and sermons such as this to decide if God is real was, is there a son, Jesus Christ? Did said son come unto mankind, serving as the sacrificial lamb? So through the shedding of his blood upon the cross of Calvary, all the sins of mankind were washed away, affording any and all who shall believe in him the forgiveness of their sins, the promise of eternal life beyond death, and escape from the grip of sin and evilness upon the earth. That's my calling, my mission on earth for the remainder of my days granted unto me by God's great grace. And I do so pray some part of my efforts at evangelism draw those who need to hear his word closer to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Go in peace, my brothers and sisters. 
go in peace. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, it is my prayer unto you that your will be done through this message. Take it and spread it as far and as wide as possible, that in doing so, those who so desperately need to hear your truth receive it into their hearts, bringing forth a revelation in their spirits and a birth or rebirth of faithfulness in you and your Son, Jesus Christ. I pray you increase my knowledge and understanding of your word each and every day through the Holy Spirit, better enabling me to be a strong disciple, guiding me and leading me down the pathway you have chosen. Be with all your children this day and forevermore, protecting us from the evils of Satan. In this matter I pray unto you in Christ's holy name. Amen.